Ähm, herzlich willkommen zu meinem Vortrag hier über Fluorescent Thread Biosensor. Ähm, mein Name ist Christian ähm, und vielleicht merkt ihr es schon auch unten am Titel so ein bisschen. Ich habe äh, ja, das in Englisch versucht zu benutzen ähm, und ich werde den Vortrag jetzt auch auf Englisch halten. Um, yeah, that's why I will switch now to English and yeah, let's start. So yeah, the title of my presentation, as you can see, is Fluorescent Thread Biosensor. And I will first give you an idea of the overview of my presentation um, before we go into details and into the topics. Um, yeah, the first three dots that you can see are the basics. Afterwards, I would like to give you an detailed view of um, one specific fluorescent thread biosensor, my title is, because this is basically what the publication was about. And um, yeah, the publication is a very specific fluorescent biosensor, but before we started, like I said, we have the first three dots where we talk about the basics. And afterwards, we want to summarize it with the discussion. Let's just go directly into the topic. Uh, let's start with biosensors. Um, if you want to understand biosensor in a very um, yeah, general way, I think it's good to understand that these are basic objects that are used in biological context. Um, and what like the definition is a bit more in detail is that we basically try to detect a chemical substance and we have a we combine like a bio, we combine a biological component with a, a physiochemical uh, detector. Okay, so these two parts are important, and we use this biosensor for yeah, biological context for imaging monitoring. Um, when we talk about biosensors, um, you have subcategories. The subcategories are, yeah, there are a lot of them. I will go uh, to them as I uh, written them here out because in the end, you will see that the developed biosensor that I will mention in the publication or, yeah, go into details in the publication is going on the bottom. But let's start on the top. So see the subcategories underneath is fluorescent biosensors. So basically that are like biosensors that use fluorescent. Then we have radiometric fluorescent biosensors. Um, radiometric fluorescent biosensors are um, yeah, a specific kind of sensors because what we do they what we do there we have we basically quantitate um, the signals that we want to receive. So basically what we need is we need two signals and we basically just yeah try to analyze two of them. And this, the big advantage of that is that we basically have uh, less interference um, in general. So this is radiometric fluorescent biosensor, so that's why it's a subcategory, because it's used basically that. So we basically uh, simultaneously record uh, fluorescent uh, signals from two uh, yeah, different sources, uh, two wavelengths specifically. And we have their different types. I will talk today more about thread, but there is also ICT. I won't mention it. I just want to mention it because it's also like um, something that we need to understand that we have different type of radiometric fluorescent biosensors. ICT, it's called intermolecular change transfer. Um, it has some advantages. The efficiency is a bit higher, but thread is uh, known that it's um, has a longer uh, emission after single excitation that in mind and also that uh, yeah it's better in general with interference let's continue because we talked a lot about biosensors in general about the categories but when we talk about like the biosensor of course the i would say the most important part is the analyte so um yeah we want to know about something in um, our biological context and what you can see here on the figure zero um, yeah, I want to really uh, put your eyes on the scissor, the green scissor called furin here. Um, because here the analyte is furin. And what you can see there is, is this, I don't know if this is visible anyway. So basically what you can see there is that we have a 
green scissor and um, it's called furine and this is our analyte um, and i really want to remember this scissor metaphor because i want to later and continue with that um, and i think i wanted to mention it here because uh, it's a very common example i think because the new covid virus basically what is uh, found out that furine is in our body and when the virus is starting our body furine is activating it Furine is in general um, in our body, but basically here in this context, it's very important to understand is furine now activated or not. Uh, I will go into details what um, is doing there um, when it's activated, but yeah, basically we want to know that. So our analyte is here furine and the biosensor is to sense uh, an analyte. Yeah. Let's continue with the next slide because now, um, I talked about the scissors. Now we have them here uh, visible. So we have our um, scissors still, and it's still the thing that we want to know about. So the analyte is still our scissors. But what came, came when we talk about threat, our um, biosensor, it's important to understand what yeah the phenomenon or um, the methodology is, how we use it. So what you can see here is we have on the scissors two bulbs. One bulb here on the left side, we call it the donor. And on the other hand side, we have a second one and we call it the acceptor. And now what you see is that uh, when both of them are close together, and the acceptor is giving us a signal when they are far, so this distance is higher, then the donor is giving us a signal. And this is what FRED is doing. What is FRED? FRED is an energy transfer. You see, obviously you can see the title um, of this slide. Um, and it's visible, but just in some aspects. So we, we, we are using the donor and the acceptor to see something, to sense something, but thread itself is not radiated, so it's not vis not visible in a sense that we can yeah, get some light out of it. And basically, what's happening when we have our process is we have an excitation from outside. For example, when the scissors are furine, we have an excitation from outside. Now we know, okay, the donor is lighting up. We know, okay, something is not. Uh, there's something, uh, the distance is far away, or uh, we have a light from the acceptor and then we know, okay, the distance is very low. Or they are close together. When you want to understand the non-radiative, um, yeah, non-radiative uh, threat, the non-radiative energy transfer, you can see it in a quantum mechanic way and you can see it in a classical way. When you look to the quantum mechanical way, you have something additionally uh, where you talk about a uh, quantum change of a photon. Basically, we're talking about uh, virtual photons. Um, I want to give you here the classical idea more, but just to give in, um, yeah additional information, what is the quantum mechanical way and how it's different, just, just to mention it yeah, just now. But yeah, like I said, classical way now. So when we talk about the classical way, we talk about dipole dipole interaction. Um, dipole is basically a molecule, or yeah, this this example and later on it's a molecule, and it's basically has the center of a negative charge and the center of the positive charge on different places. Because of that, we have a um, yeah, we can call it just a dipole and when there is a different um, center for the charges you can imagine that when they move and this is what happening in a dipole they can oscillate and basically sometimes we get um, yeah um, yeah we get an interaction in there and especially in this example when you have dipole dipole interaction now uh, to understand you know, how uh, Fred is working we can see that as uh, the donor is oscillating. Like you 
can imagine their hearts in um, electrical depot. It's oscillating. And uh, energy, because they are so close together, is yeah, transferred to the acceptor really by, um, yeah, by uh, just because it's transferring it, um, the oscillating uh, movement. Um, to understand why it's not radiative, it's an important part um, that this is happening in the near field. And the near field is also a very important part um, to come to the, I think, most important also, the most important part of a uh, thread is that it's so distance uh, dependent on the distance. So, um, yeah. I will go to the next slide and go later then, but also just keep this in mind that the near field is um, yeah, really uh, have a big influence on the distance dependency of thread. Um, so on this slide, I will just give you an idea um, how we can visualize um, thread. And what you see here are Two floor of fours, so floor of one and floor of four two on the top right. And again, we can still continue with our idea of okay, we have our donor and we have our acceptor. And what you also need to see here is that when we have A, so we can see that that A is the diagrams on the top that we have both of them, they are separated. There's no, they're not close together, they're just in different test tubes, we don't connect them. Now what we do, we combine the solutions, and now we have B. Now we have two cases. U1 is the case where they are close together, and you see how the spectrum looks like. You see that the donor is um, giving us much more, uh, yeah, the signal is much stronger from the donor and when they are close together um, then we have a much stronger signal from our acceptor and yeah this distance is that's why i said it's so important is because the difference between on and off or better donor and acceptor is in the size of a um, protein it's the thickness of a membrane so the distance is very good when we want to know something about um, yeah, uh, biological contexts, for example, something that's related to the membrane, and there's free, uh, yeah, big player, if I can say this. Okay, now I want to try something. Um, I hope you all um, are yeah, uh, ready to go do something interactive.